Welcome back. We're going to start talking about applications now. Um, the fun, cool things that I'm going to kind of argue that we can do with these, uh, with these methods. Starting off with, um, I'm going to try and cover in this session two uh, applications. Um, accelerating the discovery of known and unknown species and then multi-taxon reserve prioritization. And I'm going to focus on an example uh, uh, work in Madagascar um, to illustrate these two um, different approaches. So classic problems, if you like, in terms of our knowledge of biodiversity on the planet. Um, we refer to them often as the Linnaean shortfall or the Wallacean shortfall. Um, so the Linnaean shortfall is in effect that we don't actually know um, that many of the species that are on the planet. So one way of looking at it is that for every one of the roughly one and one and a half to two, 1.7 million species that are known to exist, there are most likely at least two others, possibly uh, an awful lot more, um, that have yet been discovered and formally classified. So this is really the Linnaean shortfall. It's the fact that we don't actually know that much about biodiversity, what species are actually on the planet. And then the Wallacean shortfall, um, of course, Linnaean shortfall, um, Linnaeus, the you know, uh, system for classifying species, naming species that, that, that we use, and then Alfred Russell Wallace, often referred to as kind of the, the, the original biogeographer or the, the father of biogeography, um, was interested in, in, in spatial distributions. Um, and what's referred to as the Wallacean shortfall is that for those species that we do actually know about, we often have very, very little information um, about their distributions. So classic problems, whether you're interested in understanding evolutionary processes, you're, understanding in, in, you're, you're interested in you know, biodiversity conservation, we simply don't know all that much about the vast majority of species on the planet. So what we're going to look at in this session is how we can potentially use ecological niche models or species distribution models to um, address these two really quite fundamental challenges. What species there are and um, where, where they're actually distributed. Um, and a, a, a kind of classic paper that I'd refer you to is this paper Chris Raxworthy and, and colleagues back from 2003 in Nature, um, where it was kind of um, one of the first examples of trying to actually accelerate the discovery of, of known and unknown, these were reptiles in Madagascar. Um, uh, really cool paper that I refer you back to. What, what I'm going to do is, is a little bit of background is that my postdoc, when I finished my PhD and moved to New York to, to, to work at the American Museum of Natural History, was part of my work to, was to actually follow on from this project. So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about now is some work that's actually still unpublished, um, it's still working on it, um, but was a follow-up to, to this paper. So I'm flagging the paper because that was kind of the, 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 the initial study, but the, the actual work that I'm going to focus on is, is a little bit more recent than that. I thought it was better to, to tell you about a little bit more recent work than, than the older work. So... Back to our um, original diagram. How can we use these kind of predictions to accelerate the discovery of species that are unknown to science that we simply don't know about and also um, accelerate the discovery of, of new populations so we know more about the distributions of species that we already know about? So uh, addressing this Linnaean and Wallacean shortfall. So, um, remember, this is how we build our models. We start in a geographic space, we build the model in environmental space, and then we project back to geographic space. And we talked about these three types of predictions that we would expect to make. So the theory goes here that um, if we build our models based on the known data, which, are the, remember, all we know are the actual crosses, they're the occurrence records that we know about, and we make these kinds of predictions, what we're going to do is guide the fieldwork, museums like the American Museum in Natural, uh, of Natural History in New York and the other big museums around the world, you know, they, they've for decades, centuries really, run expeditions. What they're interested in doing is running expeditions around the world 
looking for you know, new organisms, new species, new populations of, of, of known species. So how could we actually, taking Madagascar as the case study, you know, it's a bloody big island, fourth largest island on the planet, a field crew of maybe six to eight people, including Malagasy's and, and, and folks from the museum in New York who are out there for three, four, five, six months a year. How can we target their field work to accelerate this discovery of biodiversity in a, in a landscape like Madagascar, which is really relatively poorly known? Well, what, we, what we're doing and what the theory is, we, we, we build some models based on the occurrence records and then we expect to make these types of predictions. So, if we then send out the field crews to sample within these areas that our models are predicting, but we don't yet have occurrence records from, if we send field crews out to there, we're going to expect to find two things. Well, firstly, we're going to hopefully find some new populations of species that we know about. Okay, so if we build the model, we make these kind of predictions, it was that kind of type 2 prediction. You go there because it's part of the actual distributional area, it's part of the actual distribution, you're going to find the species there and it's a way of targeting the field work to find new populations. You're basically looking in similar environments to where you've already found the species. Remember that's all these models do. They identify similar environments to where you've already found the species. Go and look there, you'd expect to find more. But these type 3 predictions are also very interesting. Taking a bit of evolutionary theory, if we assume an allopatric mode of speciation, which is kind of the default, if you like, that we often um, usually think that speciation occurs through allopatry. That is to say you start with one population or one species, one organism. Two allopatric populations, meaning they're disjunct from one another. They are spati spatially isolated, which means that there is a restricted gene flow between those populations and they diverge over time. It's a classic model of allopatric speciation. So... Take our example, if these are patches of suitable habitat and if our type 3 prediction doesn't actually, we go there and it doesn't actually house the species, you know, it's not the species that, that we, that we modelled that isn't actually found there, but what we might expect to find is a closely related species that we don't currently know about. Okay, so if we assume an allopatric mo mode of speciation, so we assume that there is some restricted gene flow um, between the, the occupied patches and the unoccupied patches, if at some point in the past this suitable habitat that we've identified has been populated, then because of restricted gene flow we would expect the populations may have diverged over time. So the bottom line is that we would hope, or at least we would theorise, that that might be an area where we'd, we would expect to find closely related but unknown species. Okay? So we set about testing this and we basically did exactly the kind of things that we've talked about in the practice sessions in this course. We generated, we gathered some environmental data, so in this case we were our data set of um, uh, uh, environmental layers for Madagascar that I've shown you, things like temperature, precipitation from different data sources, some from um, remote sensing data, some from um, the World Clim Interpolated Weather Station um, data information on slope and aspect, um, uh, some remotely sensed variables like NDVI. So we had our database and we're working at a resolution, oh, we've done different resolutions, but up to one kilometre, um, the, the smallest resolution being one kilometre um, square cells. So we got our environmental data, we got our distribution data, which was mostly taken from museum records and the collections from the last 20 to 30 years of, of surveys in Madagascar. Of course, all of those records have X and Y coordinates associated with them, so we can plot them on a map, and uh, uh, we've got our basic data to build a distribution model. So, next step, we run our actual ecological niche model. And uh, remember, this is what we started with on, you know, Monday morning, yesterday morning, um, this generic function. We've, we've used many different, multiple different models. We published using Maxent and GARP and we've run other <laughs> methods as well but essentially we're doing the same principle we're, we're running a, a, an ecological niche model and then we get this output which as I've emphasized is just showing the orange areas there we've set a threshold 
This, this is actually a max n output. So what you're seeing is a thresholded output, exactly the same as we just talked about in the last session, where the orange areas are areas in the landscape that have environments that are similar to where we've already observed the species. Okay, so that was our, um, that was our model. And uh, this actual, remember back to the last session, I, I referred to a 2007 paper on testing models with um, when you have only a few records. Well, that's the reference there, so it's in this. Um, it's in this presentation um, because another part of what we've done is, is, is thought well we're working with very low sample sizes so let's develop a, an evaluation approach that we can use to, to test the models with very few sample sizes. So we went through that process as well. We built out, we, we generated the data, we built the models, we evaluated the models and we came up with a prediction. So what did we do with the prediction? Well, we're interested in areas like this. So this is a patch of habitat that is not populated, it's not connected to the um, known populations, and yet we're saying that it's environmentally suitable for the species. And there is this kind of large patch of unsuitable habitat that we might theorise, um, again assuming an allopatric mode of speciation, could restrict gene, throw, uh, gene flow between populations, um, and therefore I basically say to the field crews, Somewhere interesting you might want to go look. Um, and what we've done is basically done this across, um, we, 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 we've done this a uh, across a whole bunch of species. Um, there's about 50 or so species piled on top of each other in this particular map. Um, all amphibians and reptiles. Um, for each species, we build the models, we calibrate them carefully for that particular species. We test the models using this... Um, jackknife evaluation approach that we haven't gone into the details of but is written up in that, in that paper. Um, we then run algorithms across the landscape just within a GIS that basically pulls out these areas of interest um, for us. So these are the areas that aren't currently populated but we think they're disjunct from known populations and they might be interesting. So they're those type 3 predictions, right? They're the type 3 predictions that we started with. We're pulling out those areas. We're ditching the rest of it. We're just interested in these. That's, that's really where we want to send the field crews to have a look. So we run it for an individual species. We pull them all out, and then all this map is showing is those for across dozens of species just layered on top of each other. So areas that come out for multiple species are shown in, in, in more red-type colours, and those that come out for just a few species are shown in, in green. But this is, in effect, a map that I would kind of laminate and give to the field crews. It's done digitally, but um, you know, this, this is the map. And I'm basically saying that, theoretically, based on some analyses, I think that these are particularly interesting areas to go and look for new populations and potentially new species. And, of course, it's also a way to test our theory, because we're not just interested in having the theory and, and, and applying it, we also want to see if the, the results agree with, with, with the theory. So during um, 2007 to 2009, um, not me, unfortunately, but the field crews um, went out for um, a few months each year and sampled a, a bunch of different areas. But before doing so, and you know, you, you, you'll see some pictures there of, of, of the critters and um, uh, there's some of the actual Malagasy um, students and, and researchers out in the field sampling for, for these species. First thing we did though when we looked at the map was say, well if you know Madagascar well, the, the, this is encouraging because we're actually picking out some of the known areas of high endemism. Okay, so um, Nossi Bay and uh, um, Saratanana and um, there are numerous places here that are well-known areas of endemism that we're pulling out in the model. So that, that was encouraging. And we can do various tests. This is actually a binomial test to show that there's a statistically significant result that we're, we're picking out areas of, of known high endemism. And that isn't a circular argument because none of these areas, when we built the models, actually included occurrence records in them. Right, because they, 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 were, they were specifically pulled out from individual species models where we didn't include 
occurrence records for you know the, where occurrence records for that species wasn't included in that prediction because they were type three predictions. We didn't have occurrence records for that species. We pulled them out. We then laid them on top of each other, and we found that for other species, for other groups, we were picking out areas of high endemism. So something interesting about those environments. So that gave us some some encouragement. But of course, there were all these other areas that basically hadn't been intensively sampled professionally for um, these kinds of critters, amphibians and reptiles, um, in, in the past. So over three, three years, three field seasons, um, we had crews go out and visit these areas. There are, what, uh, seven or eight sites there that they, that they visited and you know, spent a good few weeks at each site sampling. And over those field seasons then, 2007 to 2009, so this is still being written up. We're still working on this in effect because, okay, you get the species back from the field, but the work to do the morphology and to do the genetic analyses to really show that they are new species or to fit them on the tree of life so we know how they're related to other species or if they are, you know, just other populations of, of known species. Um, so the work's still ongoing, but it looks like we have at least 19 new just reptile species and a whole bunch of range extensions just from those three years. They're currently basically sat in jars at the American Museum of Natural History, waiting to be named and, 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 and published. Um, but we're putting forward the argument that that is a, a, a accelerating the discovery of species um, in Madagascar, and you know that this is a potentially a, a applicable in, in, in other areas as well. So here's just an example, an undescribed Kaluma um, chameleon. Um, it's new to science. We know morphologically that it's new to science, but the, you know, the work to prove it's still ongoing. Um, and then range extensions as well for some of the, these, uh, these known species. Okay, so think back to the Linnaean and Wallacean shortfalls. We are trying to dis, uh, accelerate the discovery through targeted field work using these models, the discovery of new species and new populations of known species to try and address the discovery of new species and range extension so we know more about the biogeography of other species. Okay. As usual, some references there to take away and have a look at. 